amplitude of these uh, can look at the amplitudes of these uh, these these this uh, amplitude of the vibration in those records and based on that you can you can define uh, a Richter scale so but if you look at Richter scale it goes from 0 through 10 0 1 2 3 4 5 however the point that you should always remember is that this is not a linear scale uh, for example uh, there is a 10 times increase in wave size as you go from from one one scale to another but each increase in magnitude corresponds to a 32 times increase in, in seismic energy okay so uh, a magnitude 8 earthquake releases 32 times more energy than a magnitude 7 earthquake okay and uh, when you basically so what does magnitude signify basically it tells you how much energy has been released by an earthquake okay and that can that can help you uh, assess damage however the damage is not uniform everywhere and this also depends, the damage also depends on the location of an earthquake and also depends on the depth of an earthquake. So here is a table that lists 10 largest earthquakes. The largest one that we have experienced uh, in our uh, ever is the, is the uh, Valdivia earthquake from, from Chile. This was magnitude 9.5, it was in 1960. And if you can go down the list, there's a Tohoku earthquake. And of course, there's a 9.1 Sumatra earthquake of 2004. And I think some of you may have experienced this uh, because you were, you were close, to, uh, close to Sumatra. And then we have also a Sam earthquake. This is a famous 1950 earthquake. This happened even before uh, I was born, but we studied this even when, when I was an undergraduate. So this, this is a, a list of uh, list of some great earthquakes. And of course, you know, there's lots and lots of small earthquakes taking place almost uh, uh, continuously in different parts of the world. Now, uh, as I told you, uh, whenever uh, there is a slip in the fault plane, it causes vibrations on the ground. And they give rise to different kinds of waves. And those waves, these waves are, are basically categorized into two types. One is the body waves. In the body waves, you have P waves and shear waves, and surface wave, we have rally wave and love wave. And Kyle did uh, talk about this a little bit yesterday. So I will show you some animation here. This shows you how what happened to this. Yeah, you can, you can see this, uh, the motion here, and for P wave, the direction is propagation is along the, along the this is the direction of propagation and the particles are, are polarized in the direction of, of propagation. And if you look at, uh, look at shear waves, and this, if you look at Rayleigh waves, now we can see the motion, it actually goes in and then it, it goes like that. So this is basically what we call retrograde elliptical. On the other hand, uh, shear waves propagate. You can see that this is normal to the you know, normal to the plane. Okay. So why are seismic waves important? This was also one question, and uh, I was planning to talk about this today anyway. So. Well, the well, first thing that uh, we can use those for is for determination. Of course, you know, one of the things you can do is determination of earth structure. First thing we do is to locate an earthquake and find its source mechanism. We can determine earth structures. So you can look at global structure for layering, variation of wave velocity with depth and local structure where we look at uh, details of sedimentary uh, layers and also uh, that we can correlate those to geological information you can look for oil, uh, for example. We can, uh, we can put constraints on the sources uh, of the waves in terms of their distribution, variation in strength, and relationship to plate tectonics and other, other geological uh, processes.
Now detection, this is one other branch uh, where studying a seismic waves is useful as detection of, uh, of non-earthquake explosion. For example, we are interested in discriminating between a nuclear explosion and an earthquake. Okay, so it turns out that there are some uh, characteristic features generated by, by nuclear explosions that don't match a signature from, from, from earthquake sources. And they can be used to discriminate and whether or not the countries are following comprehensive test ban treaty or CTBT. Again, uh, this is uh, all much more difficult than I just said, because a lot of times uh, people carry experiments of nuclear explosion in, inside the mountains and in tunnels so that they can hide and, and make it appear like, like earthquake signal. So this is what a typical uh, seismogram looks like uh, from an earthquake. So you can uh, note, note that we have these, this axis is in time, okay? And we have first arriving phase is a P wave arrival. This is followed by shear wave arrival and then, then surface waves. And surface waves basically have larger amplitude. And now in between you have multiple reflections, conversion and things like that. Okay. So we need seismograms to monitor seismic activities and perhaps volcanic activities as well. Uh, determine magnitude of earthquakes, locate earthquakes, determine source characteristics, which we call focal mechanism, estimation of seismic hazard. Uh, one important uh, application has been nowadays, uh, we're seeing a lot of seismicity during production of hydrocarbon uh, due to fluid injection. So this, so the seismometers are placed around the oil field and record and, we, and looking at those records, we can try to understand how, uh, how seismicity is being generated by, by, by oil and gas production. And of course, determine earth structure. And we also study a lot of these, uh, these seismograms to come up with uh, some scheme for forecasting earthquakes. And note that I do not see prediction deliberately because predicting earthquake is, is something that has not been achieved. And you know, a lot of people claim that they are able to predict earthquakes, but that's, I don't think there's a lot of credibility in there. But there are ways you can forecast earthquake by continuously monitoring a particular area that is prone to earthquake. All right, so talking about uh, Earth's interior, uh, let's look at the clues to Earth's interior. Uh, here uh, we have the epicenter. This is our outer core. This is our inner core. And these are the rays from the, from the source, which is, this is the focus. And you can see how the rays propagate here. And because of this mantle structure, you have a P wave shadow zone and there is no direct P wave, but there, are, there can be some, some other kinds of uh, the, the converted waves. And this is your mantle. And you can see that the P waves do not propagate uh, inside the, I mean, shear waves do not propagate inside the outer core. So this zone is, uh, is, the, is the shear wave uh, uh, shadow zone. So uh, that, that basically tells us about the nature of, of outer core. And I, must, I mentioned yesterday that this is the discovery that was made by, uh, by Inga Lehmann. And she concluded that, uh, that, that the outer core is fluid. The inner core is solid. So this is really quite puzzling that, you know, outer core is fluid, but the inner core is solid. And this is all based on observations of seismograms. And this is a, is a slightly more detailed picture of, of these ray paths. These are the direct S, or S rays. And this is your shadow zone. And here we have different phases. This is P wave. Uh, this is your uh, P wave through the, uh, 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 through, the, uh, through the core. And this is your uh, PKP. These are the PKP waves. So there are different nomenclatures. You can see PKP, PCP, PKIKP, PKJKP, and these are basically the names of different ray paths. So when you collect all of these seismometers uh, records uh, at different distances, starting from zero all the way to 150, 160 degrees, 
you can basically make plots of these uh, like this. This would be called a seismic record. And there you can, you can, you can identify phases like P wave, PP wave, PKP wave, S wave, SS wave, and surface waves. And then we can use this information. We can use all of these travel time tables and then use that to, to compute the velocity field and how, this, how the seismic wave velocity varies inside the earth. And using data like this, so this shows you uh, the travel time curves of different phases picked by uh, from different seismograms. And, and you can actually see the prediction also with solid lines using a model that looks, looks like this. This is called a preliminary reference of model, which is an average depth dependent velocity model. This assumes that there is no variation um, um, laterally, but indeed there are variations laterally, but this is the basic model that you start with. So you can actually see that the shear wave velocity is zero in outer core, and also this gives you a scale of depth. And I can tell you, this basically tells you how thick is the mantle and how thick is the core, okay? And this is also, this is a density plot. So using these uh, as the starting model, we do global tomography. So which means that we look for lateral variation in velocity. And again, the resolution would probably be 50 to 100 kilometers up to in the, in the shallow part. This shows you, this shows you velocity variation and this is with respect to the reference model, reference 1D model. And this negative, uh, negative uh, velocity uh, contrast, or so this is basically a, a change of velocity perturbations. And these are marked in different parts of the, of the globe where you have higher velocities in other parts of the globe. And then these are related to, the, then, 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 then it goes to, to, to material, uh, and uh, scientists or, or, ge or geologists, and they interpret like what is causing these kind of variations. You can also see this velocity drop in Northeast India and so on and so forth. So this is another slice from 2050 to 2200 kilometers where you can actually notice all of these changes in velocity. So with depth, how the velocity changes can give you clue as to, as to, the, as to what is happening in that particular region in terms of tectonic motions. This is another slice from deeper depth. And this is something I showed you yesterday. So now you should be able to relate it to, uh, to yesterday's talk. And this is a beautiful picture of a, of a subduction zone. This shows you the subducting plate as, as, a, as a positive velocity anomaly. And uh, you know this is basically interpreted as due to some kind of temperature effect. So blue colored region has positive P wave velocity and uh, which indicates a colder, uh, therefore an older plate. So this is, this is basically increasing velocity indicating that this plate is colder. So that means it's actually older. So this is also related to, to the age of the, of the plate, okay? So in a nutshell, that's what um, you need to basically have ideas about if you want to understand earthquakes and seismology. And uh, I can tell you that uh, you know, the tendency of students has been to ignore seismology and straightway jump into reflection seismology because our seismic exploration, because that has, uh, that gives you jobs and gives you pretty fat salary. However, you cannot be a reflection seismologist. You cannot be a very good exploration seismologist if you do not understand seismology or earthquakes, earthquakes because the basic ideas came from there only. Okay. So explorations in exploration seismology, uh, unlike earthquake seismology, where the source is not in, not under our control, uh, in exploration seismology, we do control. We carry out controlled experiments. So we generate artificial earthquake, but for small ones. We cannot generate big earthquakes. Uh, even then, that will cause a lot of damage. So we we generally. Uh, generate a small artificial earthquake, which propagates through a, through a small uh, region of the, of the earth that we're interested in. And for that, we use explosives, and sometimes we use something called vibrator trucks, and for marine experiments here again. So these are different kinds of sources that are used to generate uh, tiny earthquakes, and then those waves are recorded, and they are then used to determine velocity structure, and then, uh, 
then from there, we basically uh, try to figure out like what is going on inside that, what kind of uh, what kind of resources are available uh, under the surface. But the raw records are themselves not adequate. You have to go do some processing of those records, and and then after that, to create an image using these uh, these these seismometers or, or these seismic traces, and then carry out geological interpretation using some uh, concepts of rock theory, uh, rock physics and uh, and using some well log data as well so now uh, let's look at uh, let's look at our uh, our seismic um, uh, experiment for exploration purposes so this is this is the synthetic data i'm showing you so here i have a I have a typical velocity structure, and this particular structure that you see here is a high velocity there, high velocity zone. This is a salt body. This is typical of Gulf of Mexico, and you can see how the velocities are changing uh, with depth. And these are the regions that are of interest for, for seismic exploration purposes. And if you put a show here, you can you can get a seismic records. So we have receivers at every location on the surface and the source is given by this big star. And you can see all of these different arrivals uh, recorded here. So this has been this has been generated on computer. And uh, here, uh, oops. what happened to this movie? Yes. So you can see uh, I inject a source here and the waves are propagating. They're getting reflected from different boundaries. Then from the tip of the salt, there is a diffracted wave that is also propagating. And we have instruments all over on the surface of this, uh, this model on the, uh, on the top surface. And we collect those and that's when we get, uh, we get a seismic record like this. But then we have lots and lots of these shots. We'll start from one corner and we keep on shooting at certain interval. And then we collect all of these seismic records and we'll, we'll use them all in, uh, uh, in, in developing some velocity model and subsurface structure. So how do we uh, do the next thing? So this is basically uh, your typical shot record. So I will tell you what these different phases are. And just before I talk about, the, before I explain what these are, just I'll mention these, what they are. So this could be, the initial part could be direct wave plus some, some of the post critically reflected or turning ray arrivals. And these yellow markers are your, uh, your body and with these are your reflection events. And this, this is probably, this is, uh, this is surface wave propagating at a much, much slower velocity. So you can start to explain your seismic record by thinking about some models. We always have some model in mind when we try to interpret those. So let's say that I could have a layer over half space. I can have a simple gradient zone. I can have a layer overlying a gradient zone. I can have a layer, then I have a discontinuity, and then I have a continuous velocity chain. So all of these combinations make up a velocity model that I showed you earlier with the salt in there. So these are the building blocks of a, of a velocity model. So what happens here is now I'll talk about rays and uh, without explaining why the rays behave the way they do, uh, at this point, I'll, I'll talk about that next. So there is a direct path from source to receiver, okay? And that gives rise to a direct arrival. And then I have reflections, okay? And reflections are shown like this. Now, when uh, these reflectors, uh, let's say that the velocity V naught is greater than V1, and when it exceeds critical angle, then you have a post-critical reflection, but this also generates a head wave. And that propagates the velocity of the lower layer, and you can actually see this here, which is very weak amplitude. On the other hand, if you have, if you have a gradient zone below that interface, then the rays will turn and you will see what is called diving wave or refracted waves. And 
you can have multiple turning reflect and uh, diving waves. And it turns out that uh, these tend to come very close to the head wave times, uh, but they have higher amplitude. And because of that, you can see a much stronger amplitude in a, in a very close to the head waves, okay? And using these different phases, now we can, we can compute velocities and depth of different interfaces. So this is uh, basically a diagram of travel time superimposed on the seismic record that I had. So what controls ray paths? This is our uh, typical snail's law, which you have learned in high school physics. When you are, you uh, look at a, uh, let's say that you go to a uh, go to a pond, and then you see a or a lake, and then you see a fish. You know that the fish the fish really does not appear at the location and that is true location because the light rays bend, right? And the same principle applies here. Let's say that I have a velocity increase with depth. So you have an incident ray, and then I have a transmitted ray, and then I have another transmitted ray. And you can see the transmission angle, and uh, it depends on the, on the velocity contrast. And Snell's law basically tells you that this particular ratio, which is sine i over v, so sine of the incidence angle over v, is a constant. So whether it's a reflection or refraction, or a reflection or transmission, you always have uh, this ratio to be constant. And that tells you how the, uh, what should be the angle when it transmits or when it gets reflected. Since we have the same velocity on the same layer, a reflected ray will have the same angle as the incident ray. So, and when you have, uh, we have, uh, we have an increase in uh, velocity, then you see this, a um, decrease in velocity, you see this, and this is V2 equals V1. So there is no, uh, there is no ray bending. When V2 is greater than V1, then there is a bending away from the, from the normal. Okay, so this is something that you should have in mind all the time. And this shows you, uh, as the critical angle, how the, how the, uh, Okay, so these are the head waves. Any problem? My regular. Hmm? Any question? Sorry for, so sorry for the interruption. I think her mic was turned on okay. for some reason. Okay, okay. Okay. So anyway, uh, so these are the deflected waves and I will go quickly over this. So this is what happens at an, infer, inter, uh, the, at an interface. You have an incident P wave that gets reflected as P. And then incident P wave uh, can also uh, uh, have a converted shear wave. Now note that the, the angle of reflection of the shear wave is smaller than the angle of incidence of P wave. And this is because of Snell's law that tells you that sine I over V is a constant. And since shear wave velocity is smaller than P wave velocity, we have a smaller angle, okay? So uh, for reflection and transmission, as I told you yesterday, a part of energy gets reflected and a part gets transmitted. So what is the amount of energy that gets reflected? So this is given by boundary conditions. That also I mentioned yesterday, which basically means continuity of stress and continuity of displacement. Giving that, using that concept, we can calculate the reflection coefficient, which is basically an incident ray. For the normal incidence, this is given by, by the contrast in acoustic impedance. And here we have V1 rho 1, here you have V2 rho 2, and uh, this is basically I2 minus I1 by I2 plus I1. So you can see that this is this the reflection uh, of a uh, reflected energy of a reflected wave. A normal incidence or any other incidence depends not only on velocity but also on density. Okay, so this this is a very important parameter. And if you look at uh, look at uh, uh, the variation in amplitude with respect to angle, uh, you can see that this is how you, this is how a reflected P wave uh, amplitude or um, the reflection coefficient changes. It may decrease and then it basically increases. Then it goes to uh, a critical angle, and this is your your uh, 
post-critical or total internal reflection. So you can draw similar, you know, similar diagrams for, for S waves and, and refracted waves or transmitted waves. So we take all these seismic records and then we go through some basic processing steps like uh, CDP sorting or CMP sorting and velocity analysis followed by NO correction and stacking. So here is uh, the idea behind seismic exploration. So let's say that I have all of these shots, the sources and receivers, let's say that they're coincident, but they are not, but this is still a thought experiment. And I'm sending in normal incident uh, rays. So as the rays enter uh, inside the earth, it gets reflected and then and reflect back and they're recorded at the surface. So if you have all of these layers flat, then my recorded energy will all line up along these, uh, these uh, interfaces, okay? So this then represents my subsurface geology, right? So that is the idea. So, and this is what is done for seafloor mapping very, very successfully. Uh, but uh, for exploration seismology, we're interested in, in, in not only flat layers, but also we're more interested in, in, in changes or lateral variation. So how do we do that? So we record our short records like this, this are short, and this is, these are my receivers. And then I take all of these short records and I form a, a hypothetical experiment where uh, my shots and receivers are uh, equidistance uh, and no, they, the midpoint stays the same, okay? So you can say this is the shot, this is the receiver, this is the shot, this is the receiver. And you can generate this kind of a data right from all the shots. You just have to identify the midpoint between the shot and the receiver and take traces that, are, uh, that, that, that correspond to a particular common midpoint. And then we plot that. So this is a, this is a gather. And you can, this, is a, this is a CMP gather, um, common midpoint gather. It's also called CDP. It's a CD, CMP, CDP, only if layers are flat. So you can see all of these different uh, reflection events. So what do we do next with this is we just take these CMP gathers and, uh, and then we uh, apply something called, called normal move out. So what normal move out does is it takes each trace and moves it to, to the, uh, the two-way time of the normal incident. So let's say that this is my trace at, at the nearest offset or zero offset. So all traces are simply moved, these events are simply moved to be parallel to this, and then you can stack. Remember, this is all from a CMP. So once you stack them, once you align those and then stack them, they're all coming from the same, same depth point, right? So that will give, you an, give us an image of the, of the subsurface. So the original location is this, but then we have moved it out here and then we stack them. So once we take all of these gathers, and for that we need velocity to be able to line those up. And there is a procedure for scanning velocity. We do that and then we line up all these reflections and then we stack those. And that can give me one, that will give me one trace corresponding to one CMP. And then I will line them up, all of these CDPs or CMPs, and that will give me a structure that looks like this. So you can see this beautiful basin structure and that, that is basically formed from stacking a whole bunch of CMPs. However, it's a bit more difficult um, in general. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, our earth is not flat. So you have a common source receiver, and this is my, my uh, time section. However, when there is an interface, we are recording reflections from, uh, from the normal incidence. But when I'm plotting it in the seismogram, it goes right below the midpoint, even though the reflection actually took place at a different location here. But your seismic trace tells you that this actually came from right underneath this particular CMP. So what is the implication of that? The implication of this is that in this section, you will have an event which will have a dip that is different from the from the true dip of an interface. So how do we correct for that? We use something, something called, called migration. And seismic migration takes care, makes use of the velocity to basically take the unmigrated position 
and moves it to the uh, to the to the position where it should be according to the reflection uh, according to the dipping part of the of the reflection and then we can generate depth sections which is basically very close to being a true representation of the subsurface depth and that is what we are going to be using for for seismic interpretation so one interesting thing that happens is 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 when we have say uh, oops uh, oh, I don't know what happened. Yeah, so when you have a syncline model, look at this is a syncline model. So this is a uh, this is a reflector, and now uh, when the flat when you look at the flat part, these normal incident rays they go up and down, and you can actually get a beautiful image of the subsurface without doing anything. But as soon as you hit this part of the model you have multiple arrivals. Now the normal incident rays are like this. And then also you have uh, rays going up and down. So this looks, if you look at the travel time, this looks like a bow tie. The, so what you see here is that uh, even though the structure is syncline, this actually appears like an anticline. So how do we correct for that? Again, we, we uh, run migration. And here is an example of a, of a seismic section. You can see the unmigrated seismic section with all of this big bold kind of structure, but after migration, you can see that it has basically moved into like this. So migration is a very, very important processing step. And uh, we, one must migrate the data before carrying out any kind of geological interpretation. One quick thing I wanted to go over is seismic resolution. So this uh, refers to the level of detail one can decipher from seismic data. And uh, from your basic uh, physics, you know that the velocity is given by the frequency times wavelength. And typically uh, we say that we can resolve features uh, like that are uh, thicker than one quarter of a wavelength, okay? And how do you compute the wavelength? It's velocity by frequency. So there are two factors that come into play. One is the velocity in the subsurface and other is the frequency of the source, okay? And using those, you can calculate, uh, uh, calculate what is the resolution. For example, if you are at a 10 kilometer depth and let's say that you have an average P wave velocity is 1000 meters per second, actually it's, it's higher than that, but in any case, Let's assume that it's a thousand kilometers per thousand meters per second with a frequency of 100 hertz. That gives us a resolution of 2.5 meters. However, uh, uh, at a depth of five kilometers, if the velocity is five kilometers per second and the frequency is 20 hertz, then you have uh, 250 meters. So this basically tells you lower the frequency, lower is the, is the resolution. But you know, as the seismic waves propagate inside the Earth, the Earth acts as a as a as a low pass filter. It actually filters out high frequencies. So what it means, and also velocity increases with depth. So what it means is that as you go deeper and deeper inside the Earth, your resolution continues to decrease. Okay. All right, so I talked a lot about the amplitude and uh, the travel time analysis very quickly on, uh, on, on amplitude analysis. So there was a major breakthrough by a paper by Ostrander in 1984, where he showed that the presence of gas in sand capped by shell would cause an amplitude variation with offset, okay? So what he showed is that uh, if you uh, have, uh, so let's say you have a structure like this, and from here you got the seismic section and that came out of, of CDP, CDP gather. Then you can look at the amplitude variation as a function of offset and which may look like this. Now it turns out that uh, uh, when you, in a particular situation where the, this amplitude variation is such that when you stack those, they give rise to very bright reflections and these are called, called bright spot, okay? So I'll show you some example of a bright spot in seismic data. This is a, this is a marine seismic data from, from Blake Ridge. And here you can see a beautiful uh, bright reflection and with a, with a negative polarity. And this is basically uh, um, 
what you call base of gas hydrate, and this is caused by, by accumulation of free gas. This is again a bright spot anomaly, and this is a, uh, this is from a, from an oil field, and you can see all this this bright reflection. So when people found these bright reflections, that they drilled and they found gas, and they were quite thrilled without understanding why this was happening. And uh, this guy uh, then Ostrander first talked about it, and then Rutherford and Williams computed reflection coefficient, and they showed different behavior for different kinds of uh, different kinds of lithology. So this shows a class one, this is class two, and this is class three. So class one has a, has a strong positive amplitude at the near offset, but then it decreases. Class three has a, has a very strong negative amplitude, but it becomes more and more negative, okay? So these curves correspond to uh, different kinds of sand so class one would be high impedance sand, class two would be nearly same as shell impedance, and class three is low impedance. The reason I wanted to also emphasize this here is that in yesterday's lecture by Kyle Spikes, uh, he mentioned to you that the velocities and densities of different uh, rocks, they vary, right? They depend on several factors. And there can be situations where your sand velocity or sand impedance may be higher than shell, it could be very close to shell impedance, or it could be low impedance. And it, that all depends on what kind of uh, pore space they have, at what depth they occur, what kind of pore fluid they have. So here is an example of, uh, of, a, of, a, um, of a channel sand. And here you can actually see that there is a, uh, there is a, there is a decrease in amplitude and that happens because if you look at the uh, look at the uh, traces as a function of offset, there is a change in polarity, and when you stack those, that gives rise to uh, gives rise to a decrease in amplitude. So class one sand can give you a decrease in amplitude. This is these are some real gathers. You can see how there is a nice flip in polarity. Now this is a class two sand and most interesting of all of these is the class three sand where you have some, some bright reflections. And if you look at, uh, look at the gathers, these are, these are the traces for different angles of reflection. You can see that as a function of angle, you have an increase and becomes, becomes higher and higher amplitude as you go to higher offset or higher angles. And when you stack those up, they give rise to what is known as bright spot. So nowadays we are making use of these properties of amplitude variation and offset using seismic inversion. So we take some of these uh, the seismic records and directly map those into, into say acoustic impedance. So here uh, you notice certain things. In the first, uh, in the top figure in the seismic section, there's a yellow marker here. There's another yellow marker here. So if you, uh, if I were to, ask you to draw the line between, uh, between this yellow marker to this side, you'll be lost somewhere in the middle. However, if I look at my inverted acoustic impedance, you can actually see that it's much easier to demarcate the, the, the reservoir zone, okay? But what we're getting is, is acoustic impedance. But such, such plots are such data sets where you can convert uh, those seismic records into, into physical uh, or the elastic properties is called seismic inversion. But that itself is not enough because we now need to interpret those in terms of the actual rock properties. And that is done using uh, this workflow. So I have a seismic record, a seismic section with wells and horizons, and I use those in the seismic inversion tool then I generate acoustic impedance. So these are pseudo logs of acoustic impedance. Then I integrate this with well log data, core data, and rock physics model. We can use some statistical model and geostatistics. And then finally, we can come up with, with some descriptions of phases, porosity, saturation, shell volume, sand, and probability maps. And this is the final product of seismic inversion that will go to that will go to uh, an inter uh, go to a reservoir engineers. 
And you can also use machine learning. So here we have field record to CMP sorting, velocity analysis, NMO, time migration, and inversion. That is the pretty much a standard procedure now. But what we are gearing towards is, 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 is FWI technology where we do minimal processing except for just initial velocity model building and run FWI or full waveform inversion, which will give us not only a depth image, but also a 2D and 3D interval velocity model. So we can basically do all of these in one step and we can get away, uh, we can basically avoid any kind of CMP sorting kind of concept because CMP is essentially valid for 1D medium. So I told you about a lot of different things, but uh, I just wanted to tell you that in Jackson School of Geosciences, we offer many courses and uh, all of these courses are essential to have a good grasp of seismic wave propagation and, and inversion uh, for, and then characterizing those for, for reservoirs. So we have three courses, seismology one, two, and three. We have a solid earth geophysics, then we do seismic data processing, we have quantitative seismic interpretation, rock physics, university and machine learning, and there are some other courses. These are all mostly uh, graduate courses. Seismology one is both listed as graduate and undergraduate courses, but, uh, but these are the courses that one needs to have a solid background in the, in the, in the overall branch of, of, of science in, in exploration seismology. All right, so here is our um, school, Jackson School of Geosciences at the University of Texas. We have three units, Department of Geological Sciences, the Bureau of Economic Geology, Institute for Geophysics, and we are uh, one of the top ranking departments in geophysics and geology. And we're always looking for talented students. It's very competitive to get accepted here, but uh, we welcome applications from, from the best students around the world. So if you're interested, feel free to talk to us about the procedure and then try and see whether you are accepted here. We're also quite crazy about football. And this is a, a picture from a, from a game and you can see the band lined up as Texas Pokemon. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd be happy to take some questions. This is where I'd like to stop. Thank you very much, sir, for a thorough and wonderful lecture session. I hope that this was really helpful towards our participants of the workshop. Uh, we are going to take a short break right now for my prayer. Um, yeah. We're going to uh, we're going to continue our session from seven ten sharp in Bangladesh time. Uh, please mm -hmm. stay tuned with us. In the meantime, if you have any questions, you can ask in the chat box. We're going to read it out for sir after the break. Thank you very much. He has present a virtual workshop on rock physics and seismology. Thank you for your patience during the break. Anyway, feel free to ask any question regarding our session. You can ask the question by turning on your mic or you can write it down to the chat box. Thank you. Well, it doesn't look like there's any question, so you can move on to the next phase. Yes, sir, we're just looking for it.
हेलो हेलो सर माय क्वेश्चन इज कैन वी डू ट्रेस इक्वलाइजेशन बिफोर माइग्रेशन या यू कैन डू दैट सर depends on you know what kind of migration you want to do yes sir um, what is uh, root stack is it uh, inmo corrected cd uh, inmo corrected cdp stack or something else yeah yeah it's just inmo corrected cdp stack where the velocities are not necessarily you know the best that you can get so this is just a quick and dirty way of looking at the section before you do any kind of you know advanced processing okay sir thank you um there is a question in my box right now um a first year student is asking that does the yeah is it necessary for geophysicists to do all the processes we are implementing is yes it is it necessary to for the geologists to do all the processes manually or is there any software based technology that can do automatically all the processes of this seismic survey well, all the processing is done on computer so i, I don't think uh, you have to do anything manually even interpretation uh can be done on 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 workstations where you can actually load the entire 3d seismic volume and then go through different parts of the volume and then then come up with a geological interpretation so most most of what we do is is basically on computer okay sir so the, um yeah sir um uh, when we are taking cmp uh, cmp gather in that mm -hmm. case uh, if the reflector is dipping then the reflection are not coming from uh, from the same uh, same subsurface point right in, uh, in that case is it uh, is it increase the fold up coverage or okay so you know the thing is that if it's a very strongly um, if it has a very large dip then uh, there'll be a lot of spread in the depth point for the particular common midpoint so in that case this whole cdp uh, kind of uh, assumption breaks down it's the only way to get around that is to directly go into depth migration from the short gathers okay. so basically what happens is when there is lateral heterogeneity uh, your uh, your midpoint for different uh, offsets at a particular cdp is for a common depth point i'm sorry for a common midpoint and corresponding to different offsets you have a slightly different depth point so it's not a so, so i don't think you can comment on the fold but uh, generally what you do is when you compute the fold you go over a over a finite size bin and count all the points within that bin to come up with the fold so i don't think it actually increases fold um there's another question in my inbox right now uh, mm -hmm. um he's asking that is there any difference between the characteristics of foreshocks and aftershocks for example intensity magnitude etc is there no any generally four shocks are smaller and after shocks can be big but i don't think uh, i don't think there is a particular characteristics in, in general okay thank you sir um is there if there is any other questions please do write it in the chat box or you can ask it directly by turning on your mic thank you i think that covers all the questions regarding today's lecture um if there there are no more questions we can proceed to the next part of our program i think is it okay with you sir yeah so do you want us to stay uh yes sir uh, right now we have a quiz competition for the participants on the topic discussed in the workshop okay um 
everyone can participate in this competition. Uh, let me read out the rules for the competition first. Um, in this quiz, each of you have to answer 25 questions provided by our honorable speakers. There will be no negative marking for no wrong answer. You will have precisely 20 minutes to complete the quiz and submit it. After 20 minutes, we will stop taking the answers. If there is a tie, the winner will be decided based on the submission time. Please note that your name and your provided email address into the quiz, quiz form should match with the registered one. The quiz link is going to be provided in the chat box of our meeting. Oh. Mm -mm. Looks like he froze. Yes. Must be internet connection problem. To everyone, um, I think our host will provide the link into the chat box. Thank you, everyone. And best of luck. Please note that we will give you two reminders at 15 and 19.
if anyone is facing any difficulties regarding the quiz session, please inbox our official UDGS account. Thank you.
ladies and gentlemen, there is only five minutes left for our quiz session. Please submit your quiz as soon as possible. Thank you. There is only one minute left for the quiz session. Everyone, please submit your quiz as soon as possible. Thank you.
ladies and gentlemen, the time is up for the quiz. We'll be announcing the winners shortly. Please bear with us till then. Thank you. That there's a question in the chat box for you in the meantime. Um, is it possible to use these methods? <clears throat> I guess he's missing the seismic method to get seismic data from other exoplanets, ex ex exoplanet, sorry, exoplanets. As we know that they have different inner compositions, will they work on the exoplanet? Yeah, so you know, there are some, uh, especially in the moon, we have the knowledge of moon quakes and uh, seismometers were placed there and recordings were done and which were then used to derive a velocity model and the internal structure of moon. So well, other planets, I guess you have to first make sure that there are, uh, there are earthquakes. Um, shouldn't call those earthquake planet quakes and then uh, then if they do occur in those places then if it is possible to place seismometers we should do that and that would really help us to determine the internal structure and some i think uh, well there are many different ways people come up with internal inner composition not necessarily by by seismic waves there could be they could be based on you know geochemical analysis, chemical analysis of different rock types and things like that also. And basically based on some kind of uh, extrapolation. So they can take the rock sample and then, you know, examine its properties under high temperature and pressure, and then look at some of these outcrops or some of the rocks that have been exposed. And then using those, they try to determine the structure. But to answer your question, whether there are seismic data, there are only, I think I'm aware of seismic data from, from Moon and not for any other place. Thank you, sir. Sir, if there is no uh, active tectonic activities on other planets, uh, uh, we can use these methods to uh, determine the seismic data, as you said, uh, from the exposed rocks or uh, geochemical analysis. Yeah, so from the exposed rocks and all, they can then uh, look at the properties, composition, and uh, then then basically think about what temperature and pressure conditions they were they developed, and then they can sort of extrapolate it to to different depths and come up with some kind of structural uh, scenario. Although this is really uh, highly speculative because of the lack of data. Yeah. Okay. The only other piece of information that they might have is from uh, is somehow estimating or monitoring um, 
tides, so solid earth tides or solid planet tides uh, as, as the planets orbit their individual suns. Thank you, sir. Uh, may I add uh, something on this uh, question's answer? Yes, uh, the belief of the tectonics is uh, only in the earth. So there is, it is not necessary that the other planets, uh, we have to really compare with it, with the tectonics of the earth. So there are other processes going on because the structure of the inner structure is quite similar of any, any planet or any, any object excess terrestrial. So inner part is mostly are hot and uh, under high pressure. So any pressure difference, and th there are some causes of uh, uh, earthquakes because of the gravitational differences. There is another school of belief that te plate tectonics does not exist. And <laughs> so they believe in gravitational. So there is another part of the earth physics. So it is not necessary, it has to be a tectonic movement. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, we finally have the results of the quiz in our hand. And uh, right now I would like to request our honorable speakers to announce the winners of our quiz competition. Uh, the message, the winning list is inboxed in your chat box. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, the second runner up is Onupam Hasi Bros. Did you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can. Yes, sir. We can yes, hear sir. you. Okay. Uh, first runner up is Rakibul Hassan Badhon. The winner is Rejwana Sharmin Nirjana. Congratulations to, to the winners and uh, thank you for your participation. It has been a pleasure to, to talk to you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And congratulations to Rejwana Sharmin Nirjana for winning the quiz competition. The winner of the quiz and the participants who have attended the workshop will get their respective certificates within a few days. Thank you very much for your participations once again. Um, I would like to thank Professor Dr. Minelson and Dr. Carl Spike for the, from the bottom of my heart for being here with us and giving us their valuable time teaching us something new. UDGS is forever grateful to you, sir, for your support and your guidelines. Um, sir, can you please give us some words on the program and our UDGS, if there is any advice or something that we can do or improve further? Minal, sir, first. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Zaur, and uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I think the way you guys organized it actually went pretty well. Uh, although I don't see all uh, the participants, but uh, uh, seems to have a lot of people uh, attending this. Uh, I think this is the this is the best way to to conduct a, a workshop when we have you know trouble traveling. But actually, this has advantages also. If you were actually doing it in person, you won't have so many participants from different parts of the world because you know. Last few months, I've been giving several webinars, and uh, I see participants from different parts of the world, and that would not have been, you know, I mean, if it was, I think we have learned something. Next time, even if we have uh, in-person workshops or seminar, we would try to broadcast it so that more people can take advantage of that. From my side, you know, I did, you know it's been a pleasure, and I would have been even happier to actually visit your campus and give my talk there uh, and also you know uh, see the place uh, but uh, nonetheless this is uh, this is very well organized i must congratulate you for doing this in a flawless manner and fortunately we never had any uh, any net, net failure this is one problem that we run into because in the last couple of semester we have been teaching mostly online 
and there have been a few days where we had bad weather so there was some problem but other than that i think we could do it smoothly and uh, that's all i have so congratulations to the winner and thank you for uh, attending if any student has any question and this is not the end of it you can send us emails and we'll be happy to uh, you know respond to those okay thank you thank you so much for your kind words sir and you are always invited to you anytime um mr dr kyle i would like to ask for a little word about us and any guidelines if you can provide us thank you so much uh, well, for, for the workshop, again, it went very well. Uh, so good job on organizing that. In terms of your geophysical society, it seems that you have quite a few members. And uh, so maintain that, keep that up, and uh, use it as a resource, which I think you all already do actually quite well. And so um, the, uh, the connection that you have uh, will go you know, well beyond this particular workshop. And if you do another one or you do some other type of activity, then uh, I think you're well situated to do that. So thank you again. Congratulations to the winners. And it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind words. And thank you for everything. You two have been a very good asset for us in this workshop. Um, I would also like to thank all the committee members of UDGS who have worked their best to make this program successful. And finally, a hearty thanks to all the participants for being here with us for the first two days. I hope this workshop was fruitful to everyone. Uh, by thanking Dr. Mrenal and Dr. Kyle once again, I would like to conclude today's session. Our special gratitude to Masuma Madam for helping us with this workshop. I would like to mention that this is just the beginning of a journey for us. We will arrange more events on different topics very soon. To learn more about our further programs, join us in our Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn page. And thank you very much for every, everyone's patience. Till next time, goodbye. Bye-bye.